Bank. Please welcome to the stage college football playoff executive director, Rich Clark. All right. Thank you, Sattvik, and uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, being here today. I'm Rich Clark, a uh, brand-new executive director of College Football Playoff. It's been about five weeks, and six weeks ago, I was in the Air Force, retired after 38 years, and uh, I can't tell you how excited and how grateful I am to be here, and I just want to give you a little bit of an introduction to me, but also a little bit of insight into some of my thoughts about where we are right now with, uh, with the playoff. Uh, an exciting time for sure, but I want to thank uh, Commissioner Petiti for having me and the Big Ten team. Great hospitality, but thank you uh, for allowing me to be here. Uh, I appreciate all of our student athletes, coaches, athletic directors who are here. You're what it's all about, and thank you for uh, your presence and our media partners as well. So many of you I've been able to see over the last few weeks, but uh, thank you also for taking the time. Um, when I think about my time, though, and, and this opportunity that I have, like I said, I'm full of gratitude and excitement. And I'll tell you, the reason I'm so excited is because I get to give back to the sport that gave so much to me. I've been a fan of college football for my whole life. I played college football. I played at the Air Force Academy back in uh, 1985, so it was a long time ago. But um, four years there, work, played for Ken Hatfield and Fisher DeBerry, but this sport did more for me than I think uh, most people. First, it opened doors for me. If it wasn't for football, I'd have never gone to the Air Force Academy. And I can remember sitting on a couch in my house when Coach Hatfield, Ken Hatfield came to talk to my parents as a high school senior, and uh, I was not thinking about going to a service academy. And Coach Hatfield told my mom, just, just let them come out. And my mother, in, in true fashion, said, you know what, it's free, just go. And I went, I loved our coaching staff, I loved what the academy brought, and I wanted to play football there, and that's where I went. But the experiences and the people that I met were absolutely incredible. In fact, Coach Hatfield was the one that brought me in, and Coach Hatfield was at my retirement just six weeks ago. And uh, those are the kinds of people, your teammates, your coaches, the people that you come into contact with, that's what football is about. But it's also about the development. And we have to keep that in mind. Developing leaders, developing student athletes to go out and do great things. I like to quote Douglas MacArthur sometimes who said, on the fields of friendly strife are sown the seeds that on other fields on other days will bear the fruits of victory. And what he's saying there is that you learn things on the, on the field, on the court, on the track, on the ice, whatever sport it is, you learn things about life. You learn things about your character and who you're going to be and how you're going to perform in other situations that you learn playing the sport that you played. And I learned things in football that I will never, ever be able to forget. And I am grateful that they're a part of who I am. And, and the most, uh, I think, telling time was in combat. I was a pilot for uh, probably 25 years of my career. And I will never fly flying over Baghdad. And before we went into the, uh, into the breach, watching the anti-aircraft artillery flying up, watching missiles fly by, and knowing that we were about to head into something that was tough. And leading a four-ship of B-1 bombers into that was one of the most uh, challenging days of my life, but one of the most memorable days because of what we had to do. And what I will tell you is after the fact, I thought that was like getting ready to go play a game. The stakes are different. The whole situation is different. But the things that you face, the character that you have to have, what you dig deep in to find within yourself to go do that is absolutely what you dig deep to go onto a football field and face an offensive lineman that outweighs you by 70 pounds and go, OK, here we are. Let's do this. We have trained. We prepared. We have practiced. But everything I learned, I learned it on the football field. And I'm grateful for what it did for me. And then finally, as a fan, 
being able to do this is absolutely incredible because for my whole 38 years, I thought about war every day and preparing for combat every day. I thought about the worst days that America could have. I thought about it as a day that I hoped would never come, but it was something that I was passionate about because I knew it was my job to do it. And that's what I did. Now, I get to think about college football every day. I get to think about a sport that I love. I get to think about something that is going to be the best days rather than the worst days that our country is going to have. And I get to think about it in terms that will help us to move into this next chapter. And I couldn't be more excited to be here and be a part of this. And the reason I'm excited too is because my timing couldn't be better. I always say better lucky than good, and I am lucky to be coming here right now as we transition to the 12-team playoff. And I'm grateful to our commissioners for the, the, the format that they've laid out before us. I think this format is going to, of course, create the access that we need so that we can determine that championship on the field. We can determine who the best team is on the field and not have to rely so much on a committee to do that. And that's going to be exciting for our future. I think one of the principles that our commissioners had when they honor conference champions, I think that is a great, great aspect of this because the top five conference champions are going to go into the, into the playoff, automatic qualifiers. And the top four of them will get a bye. And I think that allows every conference to have that opportunity to put a team into the playoff, and that's something that we absolutely needed. And so it means something when those championship games are playing or are played. It means something as teams are going through the season, they know that that's a path that they have. There's also the, uh, the seven at-large teams that are going to come, another good pathway for teams to get in. But I think they created this playoff system that allows multiple pathways to come in, and that's going to open it up to so many other teams that hadn't had that access before, and I'm very proud that we're doing this and that we're able to be a part of it. The other thing that I think that they did that is very helpful to us is having the first round of games to be on campus. And this is going to allow our fans to really uh, to not have to travel uh, for at least that one game, but what it's really going to do is bring some electricity to the playoff because those campus games are going to be absolutely incredible. And when we uh, see the teams that are going to go, uh, we at CFP are ready to start helping them. In fact, we're already starting to communicate with all of the teams now, the 134 FBS teams, so that they can be ready uh, when the time comes to make sure they understand what the uh, requirements are going to be, what's going to be expected of them when they get into the playoff. But we're starting to build that excitement on the campuses already, and people are starting to let us know we're going to be ready to go uh, when this happens. So we're very excited about that. I think also um, the idea of um, taking the playoff to uh, the selection committee is still uh, key and critical for us because they're going to still be able to rank our teams 1 to 25. They're going to be able to narrow the field down. But the exciting thing is, all the way into November, all the way up until November, we're going to be able to see uh, that there's going to be teams that are still in the hunt. There's probably going to be 20 teams, maybe even more, that still have a shot, that could still get into the playoff. And fans are going to be uh, still excited, still engaged in the season. And, and the access that the teams have is really going to make this a much better experience for our fan base. So another reason that we're so excited about this. I want to thank our CFP team as well, because not only are they preparing for those campus games, but they're working with our great bowl partners to make sure that our bowl games are relevant. It's those six New Year's, uh, the six New Year's six bowl games are, uh, are great operators that are going to put on the quarterfinals and the semifinals. They are ready. They are the pros at this, and that's going to bring another level of excitement to their bowl games, and we're already in Atlanta. We're already working with our Atlanta site for the 25 game, which, oh, by the way, is MLK Day, which is very exciting for us, but it's also Inauguration Day, so half the country is going to be mad, half the country is going to be happy, and then we all go to a football game to come back together. So it's going to be a, a good event for all of us. And then there's going to be some people mad after the game, obviously. But it's going to be a great day, and we're getting ready for that. In fact, we're already getting ready for Miami as well. 
So we're excited about everything that CFP has and that it's bringing. I'm excited. We're starting our selection committee uh, meetings next week to educate our half of our members are new, so we're getting them ready so that they can uh, execute another successful year of ranking order, rank ordering our 25, and then off we go. So it's an exciting time in college football. Lots of change happening, lots of flux, but what we know is the 12-team playoff is going to be spectacular. And I couldn't be more excited to be a part of it, and I just look forward to uh, seeing it execute. It's coming quick, and I can't wait. So with that, uh, Sattvik, I'll stop right there and uh, take any questions that folks might have. Sounds great. Thank you. Questions for Rich Clark. All the way on your right. Rich, Steve Sturming, XL8 Sports, right here. Yes, sir. Um, first off, congratulations. The Thank second you, thing is, you, you talked about the uh, basic procedure of the CFP, but what do you think your role is going to be in that? Yeah, thank you, Steve. So, first of all, my role is going to be to make sure that our team puts on a spectacular playoff, and that's, that's our number one goal. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about what the future might hold and, and where we might go into uh, the next iterations of the playoff. But I'll be honest with you, our goal right now is to make this year spectacular. This is the format that we have. This is the format that we're going to execute, and we need to make it as amazing as it can possibly be. So that's, our, that's goal number one for us. Our other goal, though, is to make sure that the selection committee operates and functions in a, in a way that they get the top 25 teams um, rank ordered in, in an appropriate fashion, that they follow the protocols that the commissioners have laid out and that we're making uh, that uh, selection committee as effective as they can possibly be to get that right. And then, of course, uh, we all work for our commissioners and we will continue to work with them not only to assess how this season goes um, after we're all done executing it, but what kind of changes might need to occur in the future? Because we're not going to rest on our laurels. It's going to be a spectacular season, of course, but then we have to get better. There is no end to better. You always, always have to be looking forward. And we'll make sure that we're working with our commissioners to uh, assess and, and make decisions on how we go uh, into the next seasons and, and beyond. So a, a lot of different roles. Um, but. I'm, I'm excited to be here, and honestly, I'm still learning some of my roles. Some of them I didn't even know I had until I got here. But, but it's been good, better than good. Thank you. Front row on your right. Hi, Heather. <laughs> Hello, General. Heather Dennis with ESPN. Because of conference realignment and the conferences naturally being more difficult to win, how much, if any, conversation has there been about how the committee evaluates strength of schedule, and are there any considerations to change the way they evaluate that, whether through statistics or any other type of protocol? Yeah, thank you, Heather. Good question. So um, strength of schedule is always uh, a key criteria for the, the committee, and it's written into the protocol. I mean, strength of schedule, obviously record, head-to-head -head competitions. There's so many things that go into this. But what we're, we're trying not to do is tie the hands of the committee members and, and make it so, so prescriptive on how they um, use the different data that they have and, and, and incorporate that into their ranking. But what we do is emphasize that things like strength of schedule are very important that it, it is a, among the top things that they have to take into consideration. And for all the reasons that you just talked about, it's going to be critical for them uh, to take that into account. I do. I sat in on, on three of the selection committee meetings last year, and I'll say that that team operates with great sophistication. 
They, there's a lot of discussion there. And I think that they take into account the things that are, that are most important, especially as we go into some of the changes now. They're going to recognize that these changes are happening and that strength of schedule is going to matter. So um, there's science in this. There's art to this. We have the eye test. We have uh, uh, committee members that are very smart and very uh, in-depth in their knowledge of college football. So I think that that is going to always be a, a top criteria, but I think they're taking it into the right, um, I'll say, level of importance when they're making their decisions. So, um, but it is important, and it's going to be critical always in their selection. Thank you. Questions for Rich Clark. All right, that was easy. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank Rich you. All right. Great talking, everyone, and uh, we'll see you out in the, on the field. Thank you. Foster will lead his alma mater in its inaugural season in the Big Ten Conference. UCLA finished the 2023 campaign eight and five overall. Coach Foster, welcome to the Big Ten. We'll begin with your opening statement. How you guys doing? I'm happy to be here. Glad to be a part of this great conference. Um, finally putting two great emblems together, UCLA and the Big Ten. Um, we're a school that's won, what, 123 championships, so this fits us being right in this conference. Football-wise, we're just excited, you know. Um, I'm sure you guys don't know too much about UCLA, but our football program, but we're in LA. Um, it's us and uh, USC. We, um, <laughs> I'm just basically excited, really, that's it. Any questions? And a second row coach on your right side. Got him. Hey, Coach, Will Decker, LA Football Network. Uh, you were one of the premier running backs coaches within all of college football before taking the head job. I was wondering if you could talk about your two running backs within the room returning, TJ Harden and Keegan Jones, and talk about the new transfer portal running back you guys acquired, Jalen Berger uh, from Michigan State just a day ago. I'm really excited about my running back room. We have TJ Harden, Keegan Jones coming back. TJ's a bigger power back going into his junior year. Um, played a lot as a freshman really came out of his shell last season. Um, Keegan was used as a utility player last season, but he played running back all the way up to that. He's going back to running back this season also, so I'm excited for that. Um, explosive kid, um, it's when he gets the ball in his hand, you can really see a, a, a difference in his speed and um, just how he plays the game. And then we're just excited to add depth uh, with another player that's been in the Big Ten. Uh, he's been at two other schools, so we're just excited to have Jalen on our, in our program. and. Um, get him up to speed once he gets in a train camp. Coach, Brian Gillis, SB Nation. How important was it for you to get a guy like Eric Bieni on staff your first year? That was huge. Um, being a first year head coach, I needed to make sure I had somebody that I didn't have to micromanage. And, you know, having Eric Bieni, that was perfect for me because, you know, he's an established um, offense coordinator. And, you know, just the type of experiences and all of the knowledge that he has, you know, I can lean on him and, and uh, really use that. On your right side, Coach. Uh, Kansas Barry, Touchdown Tangents. Coach, how does it feel? Um, obviously, UCLA, one of the biggest institutions in the country, and one of the one of the few black head coaches around the country. How does that feel, you know, being from LA and holding down that legacy? And how do you feel like this team has kind of forged its identity under you 
you know, since that, that bowl game win and, and everything that's happened since? Um, the, the, the players, are they've, they've responded to me pretty well. You know, I didn't have too many guys hit the portal. I think I had three. Um, they're, they're taking on the challenges. They're doing what you would want players to do, you know, with a first-time head coach. Um, and then just me being a black head coach in L.A., you know, um, I'm just, just excited, especially just being at my alma mater, you know, as a coach. And, you know, you, you really don't know if that, those things are possible or, or obtainable, just being a player. So, you know, I'm just glad that, you know, I'm blessed to be in this position and I'm excited. <clears throat> Coach Adam Rittenberg with ESPN. How much are you guys devoting to preparing for the travel schedule? Hawaii, a couple of East Coast trips, you got LSU. I don't know if there's a schedule you had in the NFL that was like that or, or have you seen something like that at the college level? Yeah, um, you know, the NFL, you travel, so it's the same thing. But uh, the, first, the first two that you said, LSU and Hawaii, we, we won't be in school for those two games, so. Those aren't too bad with the travel, but Penn State and Rutgers will be um, during the school year. But, you know, it's part of the game. If you want to play uh, big time ball, you're going to have to travel. You're going to have to go to new stadiums and hostile environments. So I think we're, we're, we're looking forward to that. On your right side, Coach. Uh, Coach Bill Bender, Sporting News. Uh, you, as a player at UCLA, you did play against Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio State. I mean, uh, what are some of your memories from those games? and? Do you use them, even though it's been a long time, with your players now? Yeah, um, I try to just give them examples of certain situations. You know, um, they don't really want to hear about my playing days too much, so I don't get into that often. But yeah, we did. You know, I beat Michigan, Ohio State, played Wisconsin, so we, we've we've played a lot of Big Ten teams back then. On your back left. Hey, Deshaun, how are you? Tyler Donahue from 24-7 Sports. Um, your first Big Ten road matchup is in Happy Valley at Beaver Stadium. It's a team that UCLA hasn't played since 1968, so it feels like it kind of typifies the freshness of what this might represent in 2024. Um, looking ahead to that a little bit, I know coaches don't want to look ahead, but going to a venue that's going to hold you know, 105, 107,000 people, um, a place that UCLA hasn't ventured to and with any frequency, how much does that kind of get you excited when you think about this new era of UCLA football? That's, we're, that's why we're excited for the Big Ten. You know, you're just getting opportunities to play in a lot of stadiums that you usually wouldn't get an opportunity to. So I know our players are excited to do that. But once we get in that week, that's when we'll really lock in. But until then, we're just excited to be in the Big Ten. On your back right, Coach. Coach Foster, Kyle Golick, Mike Farrell Sports. You took over a UCLA program that had Chip Kelly leave. Danton Lynn went cross town. You had the transfer portal that can be unforgiving at times. What have you done to sell the UCLA program for the vision that you want it to be? I really just opened it up. You know, I wanted uh, people just to see what UCLA has to offer. You know, um, I, I'm not really a car salesman, so it was more of just come out here and see what we're about, see see if you can feel the energy and see if you want to be a part of that. And you know, it's been going well so far. Go Bruins. On your left side, Coach. Coach, Yogi Roth, Big Ten Network. I I'm curious, like philosophy as a head coach, what is it you can enlighten us a little bit on the ideology of your program with you now leading it? So three things that you will see with my football team is discipline, respect, and enthusiasm. Those are my pillars. And no matter what, you should be able to see that. Win, lose, or draw. You see my guys in the classroom, you should see that. You see them in the dorms, you should see that. Anywhere, you should be able to see discipline, respect, and enthusiasm out of my football players. And, you know, I think if we do that and able to present that every game, you know, the outcome will come out in our favor. Hey, Coach, uh, Nick Hamilton, Nightcast Media. First of all, congratulations on getting the job. Uh, how important was it for you to instill a culture 
Uh, a lot of the players talk about the energy, talking about just having that balance between the work and the fun in order to compete week in and week out to achieve that ultimate goal that you're looking to achieve uh, season by season's end. I just wanted to play football at a certain level and a certain type. You know, I, 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 I play football with a high energy, so I wanted my guys to do the same thing. And I felt that in some situations we just didn't bring that energy. And that's why I was making sure that we did that every day in spring. So, you know, um, it's carrying over into summer training and everything. And I'm just excited to see if we can bring it back in uh, training camp. Hey, Deshaun. Colin Wilson with the Action Network. Uh, Chip ran a lot of inside outside zone. Do you have any other run concepts you might implement from man power counter? That, you know, is it going to be more of a heavy rush offense? We'll probably do. Oh, sorry about that. We'll probably do all of that. Yeah, most likely. Questions for Coach Foster. Coach, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Okay. First of all, I just appreciate the opportunity to be here and represent the University of Iowa football program uh, at this event. Certainly, uh, you know, a lot of changes in the college football landscape over the years. And, uh, you know, take this opportunity. We have four new members joining the conference. So certainly want to welcome them. And that's certainly a sign of the times. And uh, first time ever, you know, our conference goes coast to coast now. So it's going to be a little bit of a different dynamic that way as well. So, you know, a lot of changes portal, uh, NIL, transfers, uh, what have you. And uh, certainly there'll be more coming. The next couple of years will be really interesting to see. So I think, you know, the biggest takeaway is it's like always you just have to offer, embrace, you know, change. It is inevitable. Uh, it's part of what we do certainly and certainly it's part of college football right now. And the other components try to look for opportunity as it fits your program, uh, wherever it is that you are. So yeah, that is what it is, uh, but I think the best thing about what we do, the basics haven't changed, and the single best part about coaching is being around good good people, uh, whether it's the young people, most importantly, you get to work with, or the staff, support staffs, all those uh, different groups, and kind of come together and have a chance to uh, work for common things, and that that's really what makes us so enjoyable, and you know, it's special, it's challenging, and then uh, hopefully it's rewarding as well, and uh, I can certainly say it has been, so... Uh, as we look forward right now, uh, our 2024 team, it's uh, first obvious takeaway. You know, we have a very sizable senior class, unusually big class that way. And uh, the COVID exemption added to that certainly back in January. Had a lot of guys choose to come back. Uh, I think we have a good leadership base with our football team uh, based on the work they've done thus far. And uh, as we get ready to head into camp next week, uh, we're healthy overall. And that's certainly a positive also. So. Uh, the key, key thing right now, just like it is every year, is what kind of growth can we demonstrate uh, throughout the month of August and then certainly as the season goes on as well. You know, just in a nutshell, defensively, we're, we're about as veteran as I can remember. Uh, a lot of good players back and uh, a lot of guys that have uh, done a great job. And uh, like Air Banner team, we expect those guys to be focused on growth and uh, trying to take on new challenges because those are certainly going to be coming at us offensively, certainly a little bit more veteran than we have been. And that's, uh, that's good news for us, especially up front. I think we have the potential to be, be a good offensive football team, uh, but we still have steps to take, not unlike uh, any season probably. And then special teams in a nutshell, we've uh, got our deep snapper back. That's usually not headline worthy, but uh, it's really important. We've got our place kicker and our kicker back, Drew Stevens. And uh, what is new is we lost our punter, Tory Taylor, who's an outstanding player. Uh, we've got a, a first-year player named uh, Reese Dawkins taking his spot, and uh, that'll be you know just an item of interest to see how he develops. The other other thing I think of note with the special teams losing a, a player, Cooper DeGene, who was an outstanding defensive player, but also a great punt punt returner. Uh, you know, it's that's something else I think that's impactful for our football team. So, uh, just in a nutshell, the team has done a really nice job. You know, since January we got started, they've worked. Uh, Worked well each step of the way, and I think their focus has been good. So we're, we're looking forward to next week getting together and hitting the field next Wednesday. And, um, you know, really this is what you work for. This is the most important time for a football team the next month in preparation for the, uh, for the last four months. So that's kind of where we're at right now, and I'll open it up for questions. we got second row on your right side. Okay. 
Hey, Coach, Will Decker from LA Football Network. Uh, after disappointing on offense last year, you guys made the decision to hire Tim Lester as your offensive coordinator. What was the hiring process like, and what makes you uh, Tim stand out to you as someone that can get the offense back in a good spot? Yeah, I, th I think uh, a couple of factors there. Uh, we haven't been where we want to be offensively for a couple of years. And, you know, as a coach, you have to evaluate things and be realistic. And uh, certainly last year is an easy easy thing to point out. Our top three, you know, if you had asked anybody last year at this time who are our top three offensive players, they weren't there. Basically, we started conference play. So uh, we paid for that. And, um, you know, but I thought the guys did a great job of playing with what we had and maneuvering their way through and finding a way to win 10 football games. Um, you know, going through the search process was, was interesting. Um, a lot of really good good people to visit with. I'd say a lot, a small small group of good people to visit with. And uh, Tim just really stood out. He's I think he's a, a really good fit for us. Uh, whether you talk about his personality, but you know, obviously his offensive background, his expertise, uh, played quarterback, coach quarterbacks, has been a coordinator, and then had a rare opportunity last year to really almost take a coaching sabbatical, if you will, and worked with the Packers and. Got great exposure to uh, a lot of people offensively, helped out on the defensive side. So I think he comes with a wealth of knowledge. Uh, one thing I do appreciate, he's a former head coach. That wasn't a requisite. Uh, but I also, quickly in the conversation, I, th I think he's got a deep appreciation for how football works and how offense can complement defense, special teams. Uh, everybody's going to be working on the same, you know, towards the same end. And um, so that part's all been good. And, He's been on campus now since February, very positive, very energetic, good teacher, you know, just a good people person. So he relates well to the staff, the coaches, uh, all the players, and uh, so far so good. Hi, Kirk. John Steppe, Cedar Rapids Gazette. Hope you're doing well. Kind of along Thanks, those lines, what have been kind of your biggest impressions from the kind of Shanahan-style offense that Tim has implemented, and how helpful is that visit up to Green Bay as you kind of get ready to implement this in the fall? Yeah, I mean, you know, every exposure is good, uh, whether it's us implementing it and installing it during spring practice or, you know, watching other people do it at a proficient level. And, um, you know, Every offense has its different styles and whatever, but really to me, success in offense still gets down to execution. You know, the guys up front have to block and the receivers have to block. Uh, and then, you know, somebody's got to do a good job of getting the ball where it's supposed to. And in the passing game, it's the same thing. Uh, people have to get open. They've got to make tough catches and quarterbacks got to be able to deliver and it all starts with protection. So it's, it's not like you're, you're inventing anything. Uh, it's going to be a little bit different, certainly. And uh, but I think our players really took to it uh, quickly. I went through a similar thing in 1996, I guess it would have been. We moved to Baltimore uh, when Ted Marchabrota uh, took over the offense for us. And uh, my takeaway from that was the players learned a lot faster than I did. I was the only guy that was stumbling on, you know, things that were in my memory bank. The players just move on pretty quickly. And it's kind of been that way this way, too. So it's been a good transition. And But all that being said, we've got a lot of work to do here the next four weeks. All the way in the back left. Hey, hey, Kirk, Chad Lystico, Des Moines Register. Uh, Cade McNamara seems to be fully recovered from the torn ACL. He says he's 100%, I guess, as you go into fall camp. And then you also got Brendan Sullivan here, uh, you know, Big Ten starter. So as you go into fall camp, do you view Cade as your definitive starter? And if so, why? Well, I do. I mean, we, we played against him right here on this field uh, a couple of years ago in December. And got to see him that entire season on film. So we had great respect and admiration for him as a player, a competitor. Unfortunately uh, for our fan base and the media, nobody's really, none of you guys have seen him play full speed um, you know, thus far in an Iowa uniform. So I'm eager to, to see him uh, you know, perform for us this year. Uh, nobody's more eager than he is, and hopefully he's not too eager. Uh, the good news regarding the injury, you know, I've told a couple people already today, um, you know, back in the 80s, ACL injuries could be unpredictable. Uh, no surgery is routine anymore, but fortunately, you know, 30-some years later, uh, the advances in medicine, ACLs, you know, players come back from them all the time without issue, and we anticipate that for Cade. I know he's eager to go and uh, eager to see Brendan, too, in practice. It'll be fun to, to work with him. He's been really impressive in the summer program and a uh, very competitive guy. Um, you know, he's been impressive in a lot of ways, and Seems like he's transitioned really well to Iowa City. So, yeah, we're eager to see all of our guys out there, but the quarterback position will be something of note for sure. First row on your right side. 
Coach Lynn Herring to Stay Alive yep. Power 5. How you doing today? Good. How about you? I'm doing all right, man. Good to see you again. Likewise. So to follow up on what you were talking about with Tim Lester, can you go more in depth on his relationships with the quarterbacks on the roster and the impact that he's had on the offense as a whole in the short amount of time he's been there? Yeah, you know, it's hard to judge impact because we haven't played anybody yet, but I um, see a lot of positive things. And, you know, I mean, not to oversimplify things, but I've been at Iowa now. It's my 35th year coming up. Going back to the 80s, I think one common theme, when we play well up front and we get good quarterback play, we've got a chance to to become a good offense. That's kind of been a common denominator. And uh, we haven't had that opportunity the last couple of years. I think we're finally in a position where maybe – uh, that is realistic, and uh, we're certainly hopeful we'll know more here in a couple of weeks. Um, but Tim, Tim's fit in really well. I mean, he's a, just, a, again, high-energy guy. He's got really, I think, a good grasp of what he wants to do, a good vision of where he wants to go, and he's been very um, interactive with everybody in the staff in terms of, you know, what, what do you think, what do you guys see, all those types of things. And to me, that's the quality of a good coach and a good leader, uh, and he's certainly in a leadership role. So... Uh, his transition's been very, very seamless, and uh, it's been very natural. Uh, and again, he's a player. Just from my observations, the uh, or a coach that players tend to to gravitate towards. And then he did play the position. He's coached it for a whole long time, so he does have a level of expertise with the quarterback spot. That's, um, you know, I'm not saying he's right or wrong with his opinions, but I'm just saying he's he's firm on what he believes, and he's been pretty successful. So uh, the players have really, you know, really jumped in full bore with him and. Yeah, that's what you hope to see with any any coach. On your right side, Coach. Yep. Coach Adam Jacoby, Hawkeye Beacon, uh, thanks for your time today. Uh, sticking with the QBs, the depth chart that was just released had uh, McNamara, then Linez, then Sullivan. Would you say that's still a pretty fluid situation, uh, one through three with the quarterbacks at this point? Yeah, I'd, I'd say everything's fluid right now. Uh, hopefully it won't be in the fall, but uh, right now everything's fluid. You know, and I, I, we could have listed Brandon too. You know, he hasn't put a helmet on yet for us. So uh, when we see him on the field, then you know maybe he'll be in competition uh, with the other three guys. But yeah, I expect it to be three guys competing. And you know, Kate obviously has got more experience than any of them. He's had more demonstrated success. That gives him a huge advantage. But yeah, all three guys will compete. And it's the same way at every roster spot right now. We don't have anybody that's at. You know, no, nobody's uh, just you know entitled to positions. It just doesn't work that way. On your back left, Coach. Hi, Kirk. Scott Hi, Scott. Docterman with The Athletic. Wanted to ask you about tight end Luke Lachey. You've had a good reputation of developing a lot of NFL tight ends. How does he kind of compare and contrast with some of the ones that came before him? And what's his upside this year? Now, two things about Luke and Scott. You know him, so you'll, this will resonate. He's just one of the nicest people I've ever met. Like He's unbelievably just a nice human being, a really uh, first-class guy. Um, yeah, I think we all, all suspect and know that he's a really good football player, but I, I think maybe as impressive as anything I saw was just the way he handled a very disappointing injury last year. He was fully engaged, fully immersed, and did a great job working with the other guys that were playing, playing where he was supposed to be playing. So... Um, that's a high compliment, and that's that's why he's here right now. The you know, team selected him as one of our leaders, and uh, it's it's not even close. I mean, he's up there at the top. So he's just a great quality young guy, and he's all about the team. Uh, he's an outstanding football player. And one thing we have a lot, had a lot of great tight ends come through our place. Uh, you look at a guy like George Kittle, who really has continued to improve, and he's playing at a much higher level. Was starting to play at a much higher level at age 25 than he was at 21. Uh, and that's what good players do. They just keep getting better. But the one, one common takeaway, or you know, if you look at all the tight ends we've had, they all come in different sizes, speeds, uh, makeups, but they've all found ways to really impact the game. And Luke certainly fits that. He's, he's more of a conventional tight end, can block in line, but also be a real threat in the passing game. Final question on your left, Coach. Hey, Coach. Uh, Mark Culkin, WeRSC.com, part of the Locked On USC podcast network as well. Uh, before the the bowl season started, you had talked about USC um, and how they used to play defense. What was the genesis behind that comment? And have you had a chance to talk to Lincoln Riley since then? I, I have not. And it was just a takeaway from a bowl game. They played in a couple of years ago. Dri Drive-by scouting, if you will, which is dangerous. Uh, but it was, it's a curiosity to me that, you know, because I know they've got good athletes and we've, we've played them. And, um, you know, they're, t they're a tough football team, at least they were when we played them five years ago. So my guess is, you know, I know they've taken some steps, and my guess is they're going to be a really 
we don't play them this year, so it's not our concern. But, you know, they're going to be a factor in our conference race. I'll, I'll go on a limb, make that bold prediction that they'll, they'll be there when it's all said and done. Yep. Coach Ferentz, yep. thank you so much thank for you. your time. Well, it is uh, great to be here today representing Michigan State University. Uh, it's always an exciting day to kind of kick off and get started uh, on this new adventure that uh, me and my family are really looking, looking forward to. Do uh, got three players here. They you know, represent this place as well. Uh, Nate Carter, running back, that has uh, been awesome for us uh, on and off the field, getting to know him. He's actually the first player I, I met on the team, and he's had the best offseason of his life because he got married just a few weeks ago. Uh, Dylan Tatum, uh, versatile player in the secondary, does a bunch in our community. Another one in, in our locker room has a ton of influence. I think he'll represent us today really well. And to Jack Velley, uh, tight end, very familiar with. Just got over in January to Michigan State and has dove into our locker room. feel like his skill set and then his abilities. He's had a chance to be one of the best tight ends in the country. So really excited about those three guys being here as well. Uh, even for me, being here, it is uh, impressive to uh, be a part of the Big Ten Conference with the four new schools, the additions, even following a legend like Co Coach Franz. Uh, what is impressive leads to it's going to be competitive and challenging, and I'm really excited to be able to dive into doing that in this conference. Uh, we went to work starting in December, uh, laying a foundation through spring practice that we felt really good about. We've had some new additions and new faces that we're putting this thing together this summer, this off season. Can't uh, give enough credit to our strength staff led by Mike McDonald and all the work that's been, been done. And now there's a huge amount of work moving forward that I'm really looking forward to, to doing. I want to be a place, Michigan State, of substance. I've been around building before and really looking forward to building something special here at Michigan State. With that, I'll take your questions. Thanks, Coach. We have our second row on your right side. Hey, Coach. Will Decker, LA Football Network. Uh, Aiden Childs and Jack followed you from Oregon State to Michigan State. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about Aiden, his potential in his first year, potentially starting as quarterback for the Spartans. And Jack, what makes him one of the more underrated tight ends within the country? And what makes you think he's got a shot at the Mackey Award when all said and done? Yeah, we feel uh, both those guys um, on and off the field are great additions. They had a, a good amount of options to consider. Um, and so we feel great that they chose coming to to our place. Both of them, you know, there's some advantages, familiarity within the scheme that they're going to be running, the terminology and how we call plays and how we do it. Um, Aiden, I think, athletically, he's gifted throwing the ball. He can move his feet, but he has a deep passion for this game. And so he likes studying it. I think he's got some instincts to play in the game. And yes, he's still a youngster. He's had some, some action last year, but we're looking forward to seeing how it, him playing full time, uh, how he continues to grow and give us a chance to score some points. Jim Comperoni, SpartanMag.com. Jonathan, in spring practice, what did you learn about your offensive line? And how long do you think it'll, it will take to gain some real traction there? Yeah, I think that O-line starts with a, uh, you know, they, they got a deep passion for the game. They like to play. Uh, we want to create an O-line where you're not just talk, targeted to have five guys. You want to have some depth. O-line coach Jim Mahalchek does a great job of multi-position, so we're not just targeting, oh, you're only a left tackle. We've got some playing inside and outside to be able to put the best five out there. And so we got some things established in the spring, but we have a lot of work in August, and that's for every position, to tighten up our best five but continue to have some depth because this physical game, you know you probably end up playing more than five guys during the season. On your right side, Coach. Kenneth Barry, touchdown to tangents. Coach, what's a, kind of a mantra or just, you know, a philosophy that you've had that's carried you from the Mountain West to the Pac-12 to now the Big Ten coaching this team? And moreover, when it comes to this roster, how much does it kind of resemble what you were already building at Oregon State based on just the, the character and the identity of the team? Mm -hmm. You know, you start with the first question on a mantra. I've always, uh, you know, learned a long time ago, low ego, high output in uh, how we approach it, uh, how we play the game, how we prepare for it. 
uh, even how you function as a staff, you know, not keeping it not just about yourself. Uh, this, this current roster I am excited about in regards, I think we got some talent, but we do have some guys that have a care factor for this game and not, not just about playing because there's so much work that goes into it and the work needs to be done together. This is the ultimate team game. And so trying to fill the locker room with guys that understand and want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And I think we got a lot of those guys. Third row on your left. Hi, Coach. Paul Fanson from Spartans Illustrated and the Rivals Network. Um, you've had the opportunity to either play under or um, be coached under some legends in the West Coach, such as Coach Riley, Coach Erickson, Coach Peterson. I was just wondering if you could tell us some of the most important lessons that you learned um, under their tutelage that you're now taking to East Lansing. Yeah, yeah, good, good question. I could talk for quite a while, and really all three of those guys. I think about Mike Riley at being authentic. Uh, you know, sometimes guys get the title of head coach and been doing it for a while. He never really changed his personality type. Uh, strategy, learned a ton from Coach Riley in regards. He was an offensive coordinator and a defensive coordinator in his career. That was my early on, learning about the game. Uh, got a ton from that. Dennis Erickson, ultimate competitor. This guy was competitive, no slowdown, no back down out of that guy. Evaluator of a talent. He could, he could recognize talent quickly and I had long conversations with him as a young coach on how he did that, on recognizing talent. Chris Peterson, um, you know, on the coaching side, been with him the, the longest by far. Um, he, he told a ton. You talk about organization, vision, setting a direction, alignment, creating an alignment within a program and organization, master at it. Uh, your creativity, offensive background, but creativity on the you know, offensive side, and then continue to always push, find ways to improve, never stay in the same. I learned that from, from Coach Pete. First row on your right. Coach Lynn Harry to stay alive, Power Five. How you doing today? Good. That's all right. So what I want to talk about, you know what they say, Rome wasn't built in one day. At your alma mater, Oregon State, you know, you got it going and built them up to competitivity. You know, now at Michigan State, you know, the stakes are a little higher. Um, you have a slimmer margin for error. Did you emphasize, you know, to the athletic upper powers that, you know, this thing is not going to be an overnight process and that you want to be in it for a long call and invest Long in you. Well, look, all of us are competitive, and so you know we don't have a, a long patience for p playing quality football. I, at the same time, I think you're always building. You're starting somewhere. You're going to create a foundation, then you're building off of that. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that that approach. Of we built something before, not going to panic on the first you know adversity we see. Understanding that, yes, yeah, sometimes there is a process to it, but not going to uh, say that we have patience for. Uh, we want to be in a constant state of improvement and build it the right way. On your left side, Coach. Dustin Schutte, Sports Illustrated. Uh, Coach, you spent most of your life on the West Coast. What's been the biggest adjustment coming to the Midwest or maybe the biggest culture shock for you? I wouldn't say shock. I do think uh, the community in East Lansing has been welcoming uh, and, you know, the people. Um, the pride and passion, I don't, I don't think that's different than the West Coast, but you feel it um, out, out this way. And I'm not just talking about Michigan State football. You know, an awesome opportunity to get around basketball and a year our hockey team had and the passion the place has for Michigan State. Uh, that's been really, really fun. Kim Grinnells, dogband.com, 24-7 sports. Great to see you, Jonathan. Good to see you. Hey, um, Playing at Oregon State, coaching at Washington, you know, the Oregon rivalry, I'm sure, has a special meaning. You're going into Oregon again this year. How will that be different for you this year, going in as a head coach for uh, Michigan State? And prior to you taking the job at Michigan State, when was the last time prior to that you ever wore the color green? Right. Yeah, I did not. I have not worn uh, much green leading into this, but I do have green eyes uh, on that end. Uh, look, I think, yeah, we're going to play the Ducks, and they're going to be a competitive team again. They are year in and year out. Um, that game, there might be some conversation about myself going back there, but that's really about just myself. We've got a bunch, bunch of guys that we need to prepare a certain way each week to play our best, and that'll be our, my approach by coaching the guys when we, when we head down there. we got a final question on your left side, Coach. Jacob Maurer, Impact Sports. 
you were able to keep a good chunk of your coaching staff from Oregon State, but you did have some new hires to the program, or at least new to your coaching staff. How has that been, having about half from Oregon State and half new hires on your coaching staff this offseason? Yeah, I feel good on the blend that we were able to put together. Uh, yes, we had a crew of guys that, that came over that I'm deeply rooted with. I think you know, it helps and transition to get started speaking the same language, uh, have shared experience. Um, through the years and so I thought that was real value there but at the same time we're in a, a different spot different conference location and so wanted to have some guys with some expertise uh, of the conference and with you know Chad Wilt and Joe Rossi uh, having uh, coordinated in these in this league and done it at a really high level felt good about those two additions and then it's it, important to have some guys that have walked the halls and lived the experience and so having two other coaches that have been for, uh, former Spartans and played here with Courtney Hawkins, Demetrius Martin. I think it rounded out really well with those, just those 10 full-time coaches. Coach Smith, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here today, honor to be welcomed uh, into the Big Ten. Obviously, a, a historic day and, and year getting ready uh, to, to come up and, and certainly really excited about where this is going. I know this has been an idea that's been talked about for a long time, been discussed, and now I think we're all glad that it's that it's finally here. Uh, really looking forward to the season, the incredible matchups uh, that are going to take place in the Big Ten Conference. Um, it's it's an honor to be a part of, and I know our team, our program, are all very very much looking forward to it. Uh, before I get into our team, I, I also want to mention I know a couple of my counterparts have have said some of the same uh, some of the same things regarding this notion, but. Uh, obviously, Mike Leach meant a lot uh, to my career, um, instrumental in, in my upbringing. I know there's been a lot of you know, debate and talk about him belonging in the College Football Hall of Fame and certainly want to voice my support uh, for, for that happening here on this stage. That's something that's very important to me. Uh, he changed the game and changed a lot of people's lives, mine included, uh, in, in the process of it. I know there's technicalities and rules that have to happen, but I totally agree that the Hall of Fame is just simply not complete without Mike Leach uh, being in that, and uh, just certainly wanted to be able to, to represent that here on this stage. Uh, regarding our football team here at USC, there's there's a lot of excitement, and I think really, you know, really this season in some ways for us began in the Holly, Holiday Bowl uh, in our win against Louisville, where you know we took a lot of our younger players, a lot of the guys that we've been developing behind the scenes over our first two years in Los Angeles. Uh, into a game against a really good opponent. Obviously, the guys played very well, handled the situation well, and I just feel like there's been a lot of momentum within the program um, off of that game and some of the moves that we've made, some of the changes that we've implemented uh, over the first two years. And, and so we, we certainly have, have had a great offseason. Uh, we've, we've welcomed the addition of Dan Lynn uh, along with a new defensive staff that we think makes it one of the preeminent defensive staffs in the country and certainly can feel that impact on our field and within our program. And, and certainly that was a, obviously a big change and a big f uh, focus point for us this offseason. Um, going into the Big Ten Conference this year, we're certainly looking forward to the new venues, the new challenges, getting a chance to compete against other great players, other great coaches throughout the league. Uh, but one thing that I've you know, been steadfast on since the day I got to Los Angeles was uh, our standards will never change there. Our standards at USC are to compete for championships. You know, whether we're in the beginning of this of this rebuild that we undertook two years ago uh, and, and throughout our entire time here, which is going to be a long time, uh, we are certainly looking forward to competing for championships every year. And, and now it's now it's just Big Ten championships. Um, and, and so really, really looking forward to the season, uh, looking forward to the matchups and really a historical first year for USC in the Big Ten Conference. Thanks, Coach. We'll open it up for questions. we got first row. Hey, Coach Riley, uh, Nick Hamilton, Nightcast Media. Wanted to ask you about Zachariah Branch. Um, what are some of the improvements that you've witnessed during the spring ball, and what are some of the improvements you would like to see him continue in this season as they, you all move forward? Yeah, Zachariah Branch is a, he's a, you know, had a really an outstanding freshman year for us. He's an incredibly explosive player. I mean, even, even when you're used to being on a college football field and, and you know, really talented players are somewhat the norm. He's 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 a little bit different in the way he moves and also also his strength. Um, 
He had a great year for us last year, especially as a returner. Uh, was was one of the most dominant returners in, in the country, if not the most. You know, we've really challenged him this year uh, to become a bigger part and a more consistent part of our offense. I think that that is really going to be part of his evolution. He had some some really good moments for us offensively last year, but he wasn't as as impactful as he was on special teams. And certainly, I think he's growing as a, as a receiver, as a ball carrier, understanding offenses, understanding route running, understanding uh, defenses, how we're trying to attack people. There's just a, a maturity and a growth process that we've, we've really pushed him on. And, and I think he's handled it well. Uh, that's a, we got a really talented young group of receivers there uh, that got a chance to showcase their skills in the bowl game and, and uh, certainly have had a really good spring and look forward to big things this season. Second row on your right. Hey, Coach. Uh, Will Decker, LA Football Network. You guys were able to hire DeAnton Lynn in this offseason. Uh, what was the hiring process like with Lynn, and what has impressed you so far uh, through about six months of work with DeAnton on your staff? Yeah, we, we, had some, we had some time. Certainly, we had a six weeks in between our last regular season game and then the, and then the Holiday Bowl. And so... You know, we were able to get a little bit of a head start on that search. And yeah, I mean, listen, the, the number of names that, that wanted this job was, 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 was pretty cool. And honestly, it was probably a little bit different than what it would have been two years ago when we came to LA. So I thought that was really revealing just within our profession about how this job is viewed. But honestly, I had a, my first call with, with Danton was, a, was about a, probably a 30 minute call one night and I hung up the phone. I knew like deep down in my gut, like that's the guy we're gonna hire. I just thought, he fit what we want to do from a, a team and a culture standpoint. He obviously, you know, authored the, the biggest turnaround in defensive college football last year, um, and I got a, got to see a front row seat at that. Uh, you know, playing UCLA, obviously, like we do every year. Uh, I thought the changes he made there were were, were staggering. Um, I loved his NFL experience, especially some of the trees that he came out of, um, and then we shared. I think a lot of very similar beliefs into how great defense should be played and developed um, kind of finished each other's sentences in terms of you know, philosophy and how we felt like this would be built. And, uh, and I think the last thing was a guy that was going to be able to, we're still in our climb here and our talent base has gotten better and it's going to continue to get better. And, but I want coaches that can adapt to what we have on a given year. And I think the best coaches are able to do that. And I think Dan certainly has a, an eye and ability to do that at a high level. Second row on your left here. Hey, Lincoln, Colin Wilson with the Action Network. You had 135 missed tackles during the season, only six in the bowl game. How much can that be attributed to Lynn coming in and getting Matt Entz to come in as a, a, from a program that he was and the success he had? What was the process of getting him to come in and be a part of the defense? Yeah, um, you know, Dan wasn't even coaching, so hell, if he did that, wait till you see what he does when he's actually coaching. Um, he's, you know, I, I think the guys in the bowl game, I think there was just a different mentality around the football team. That's honestly the best way that, that I can explain it. Um, those six weeks, it was almost like you had a new team, and in, in, in a lot of ways we did. And uh, there was just a great mentality going into that game. We tackle well, and I, I give a lot of credit to our, to our, to our players and the way we prepared and played that night. And it's certainly a great blueprint for us going forward on uh, the mentality that you have to play with. I think just the momentum and, and really just the togetherness. Um, I, I, think, I think the bowl game was the most together that our football team was all of last year. And I think it showed that night. Um, and yeah, hiring Matt Entz, um, among others on the defensive staff were you know, certainly just as important as the defensive coordinator hire. Uh, Matt was a little bit of an outside the box hire, but you know I've, I've always been a fan of, of what those guys have done at North Dakota State, the job they've done, you know, developing players consistently playing at a high level, playing very disciplined football. Uh, and then to be able to bring in a guy that's been a coordinator, that's been a head coach, um, I, I just felt like it's gonna make every part of our program better, not just our defense, not just our linebacker room. And he's certainly done that. I mean, to be able, you know, for Dan to have that guy in the room, uh, for me to have, you know, be able to grab Coach Entz and sit down and talk about things more from a head coaching perspective uh, has been great. He's brought some tremendous ideas in terms of development uh, that we've implemented in our program. So it, it would be, I think, foolish of me to, to bring in a guy like that and not use him and not lean on him. And we certainly have done that. And he's been a, just a tremendous addition to our, to our staff. 
first row on your right side. Kenneth Barry, touchdowns and tangents. Lincoln, in regards to the defense, um, how much has this defense kind of molded and changed the identity of the team just based on you talked about all the, you know, the new coming people and all the coaches you brought in? How have they really kind of set a tone for the team? And in regards to Hall of Fame coaches, Jeff Tefford stepped down. What does his impact on you in regards to just developing QBs and the West Coast offense and, and growing the game, what impact has he had on you? Yeah, Coach Coach Tefford, you know, obviously, you know, we we're all, you know, really, you know, just keeping him in our thoughts. Obviously, you know, hated to, to see that news. He's been somebody I've watched from afar from a long time. Uh, I got a chance to compete against him many years ago in, when, uh, in, in the Holiday Bowl. But obviously the job he's done with quarterbacks, with offenses, with teams, he's, he's been one of those guys that I've always watched and admired very much. And I've gotten to know him a little bit here over the last few years, which has been, which has been great. But certainly wish him the best. Yeah, and I think in terms of the, you know, our defense, um, listen, we, we know that's an area that we have to take jumps. And that's why we made the changes that we made. I think our team and the people within the walls and that actually know what's going on feel that momentum. Uh, you could feel it in spring ball. And I think all of our players, offense, defense, special teams, are all equally excited about the changes that were made uh, and, and the way that our defense performed this spring and the momentum that's coming. Fifth row, slight right. Dustin Schutte, Sports Illustrated. Lincoln, I apologize in advance, but I got to ask this question. A few years ago, you sent out a tweet that went viral. Fair or unfair about your smoked Easter brisket? Just curious if you're still still working on your barbecue skills out in L.A. <laughs> I just need to, I need to improve my photography skills, not my barbecuing skills. So absolutely, I, I got to work on it a little bit this summer. On your left side. Hey, hey Coach, Mark Holkin, WeRSC.com. This, during this past off season, USC has been the topic of conversation, even at other conference media days. What's your takeaway from that? What do you think the message is behind that? Um, that's just that's part of being at USC. You know, it's part of being a, a blue blood program. Um, I've had a chance to to be in two of them. You know, I'm here for the last several years and. The thing that you, you learn pretty quickly is everything in programs like this is going to be sensationalized one way or another. And it's always going to be talked about. And you either want to be in programs like that or you don't. And if you want to, you got to take the you got to take the the good with the with the bad or the crazy or however you want to describe it. Um, no, I, I, I take it as a compliment that, that we're on a lot of people's minds. Um, and I will say I listen, if I if I sat there and listened to, to every person that told me or teams that I've been a part of that we couldn't do things and then we wouldn't have been able to enjoy all the success that we've had over the years. Um, there's, you know, a lot of people, you know, inside this business, certainly inside our walls and at, at USC, you know, even in the media that I very much respect and, and, and very much, you know, look forward to hearing their opinions and love to conversate and, and talk about the game. Um, but honestly, anybody outside of that, um, I just made a decision a long time ago to, to not pay attention to it, and I think that served me well so far. Coach Lincoln Riley, thank you so much. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you uh, on behalf of our team. I appreciate uh, everyone covering us. Thank you to Commissioner Petiti and the entire Big Ten staff. Uh, welcome to uh, the four new teams especially uh, UCLA, who I spent some time as a, as a student at. So uh, UCLA, UCLA is always near and dear to my heart. So welcome. Uh, very, very proud to represent the University of Nebraska. We brought three of our best student athletes here, uh, Ty Robinson, Isaac Gifford, and Ben Scott. If, you, if you'll just allow me for a second, you know, we, um, we brought them. They're all college graduates, over 94 starts, working on their master's degrees. But if anything else, in a day and age in college football where everyone's always talking about uh, who's transferring out, talking about recruiting, uh, these guys and a couple others uh, made the decision to come back and not go to the NFL but play another year. So I'm so grateful to them. I think what we'll see in this new era of college football is the teams that can stay together and have veteran staffs, veteran teams, are going to be really good. And I think they've given us a chance to have a really good team this year. So grateful to them. Uh, it's been an exciting time for us. It's a great time to be a Husker. Uh, Troy Dannon coming in and taking over, I think it's really brought a positive energy to the athletic department. Five Big Ten championships this year in the athletic department, multiple 
uh, multiple athletes representing us in the Olympics. I finished 22nd in the all sports standings, and so now it's our time to do our part. Uh, we think we have a really good team, and we think that we're a team that uh, people are going to have to deal with this year. And uh, I've liked the way that they've worked. We finished the, uh, we finished the semester with a 3.241 accumed GPA, the highest in school history. The guys are getting it done in the, in the weight room. They're getting it done in the classroom. Now we've got to get it done on Saturdays. So with that, I'll take your questions. Coach, we got first row on your right side. Coach Lane Harrington, State Line Par 5. How you doing today? Good. How are you? I'm all right. So let's talk about last season. It's no mystery. Nebraska at the Big Ten with 16 interceptions. However, it's year two. How do you see the offense evolving under Scott Satterfield and now that you have players like Dylan Rayola in the roster? Yeah, you know, um, I, I thought last year, you know, we played three quarterbacks. I think uh, when you look, go back and look at a lot of things that happened, um, a lot of guys did do a lot of good things. You know, it's obviously overshadowed with numbers, like you said. But, you know, Marcus is a, a coach that I trust and believe in. We brought in Glenn Thomas to be the quarterback's coach, who we have a lot of history, the three of us together. And um, we have a lot of skill. One of the things that happened to us last year is, you know, a bunch of our receivers we were counting on early got hurt. Two of our tailbacks got hurt. A couple of linemen got hurt. And in the midst of that adversity, I'm always looking for, like, hey, how do we get better? And we, we put the Jalen Lloyds in, the Malachi Coleman's, young players. And by the end of the year, Jalen and Malachi were good players. So now we enter year two, and those guys are a year older. Instead of redshirting, they, they now know what to expect. We have depth at receiver. We have depth in the running back room. We, 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 we went out and recruited some really good players. We brought some guys in, in the portal like Isaiah Nayor and, and Jamal Banks. So we have a deep receiver room. And we have a deep running back room. We have a veteran offensive line. And uh, we have three quarterbacks that, that, that we know can play. And so um, I, expect us, I expect us to be great on defense. And I expect us to make a real jump on offense. Last row on your right side. Hey, Coach. Trey Redfield with NTV News and Carney all the way here in the, in the back. Um, I wanted to ask about John Butler. How does his hire um, help take this defensive back group to new heights in your second year here in Nebraska? Well, um, you know, uh, John's a guy I've known a long time, and I think any time that you can hire someone on your staff as a position coach who's been a coordinator, uh, they, they come in with a, a, another set of eyes. I've had a chance to coach against John when I was at Temple. He was at Penn State. Obviously, in the NFL, he was in Buffalo. You know, I mean, just think about in recruiting. For those guys who want to go to the NFL and they're, they're talking to us, you know, I've been in those draft rooms, but, but, but John's coached Micah Hyde. You know, he's coached Jordan Poyer. He, he's coached top five secondaries, and so... Um, you know, it was, it was unfortunate we had a change that late in the year, but we wouldn't have gotten John earlier. He was at a point where he was ready to get back in and start coaching. Um, it just kind of so happened that I was on vacation at the beach about two towns away from where he was, so it was all pretty fortuitous. Uh, we sat down, and Tony, Tony White's one of the best coaches in college football. He's an amazing defensive coordinator. Terrence Knighton is an amazing defensive line coach. Rob Dvorak, excellent young linebacker coach. I think John will bring some experience a second set of eyes, and a guy that the players can trust will make them better. Fifth row on your left side. Hi, Coach. Abby Harris, Go Big Red Cast. After completing your first season in the Big Ten, what advice do you wish you would have received? Well, one of the things about being at Nebraska, you know, you, you, you do get a lot of advice. I mean, uh, you know, Coach Osborne's there all the time to help. Coach Solich is there to help. You know, Coach Osborne tried to warn me about the, the weather. He tried to warn me about the, the wind, and I heard it, but I didn't. It was, it was until it was like 30 miles an hour in my face that I was like, oh, Coach Osborne wasn't lying. I think the biggest thing I regret from last year was, was you know, when you're in pro football, it, it's, kind of, you know, it's kind of quiet, and there, there aren't bands and things like that. The, 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 the crowd isn't. And we started our first two games last year on the road, in hostile environments. Minnesota, you know, they did a great job. They had a gold out for their first game. And so just getting readjusted to the crowd noise and, and the, the passion of the fans in the Big Ten, the, the, the atmospheres we're going to have to go into, um, we have to be better on the road. And so I wish I would have taken that, I would have taken, take, taken that to heart and gotten that advice. But I am so blessed. I mean, I, I get to coach college football, and some days I've got George Darlington, legendary, legendary uh, uh, secondary coach. I mean, I might have Tommy Frazier or Eric Crouch. I, I might have Coach Osborne there. I might have Coach Solich there. Like, it, it's, a, it's a football coach's dream. 
First row on your right side. Kenneth Barry, touching on the tangents. Coach, with all your experience coming from, I mean, you go back to the Big 12 and Baylor. Defensively, how excited are you knowing you got all these former Pac-12 schools coming in and they run a lot of up-tempo and obviously the Big 10 smash mouth football. How excited are you to kind of take on that challenge? And when it comes to just the team, how do you feel like they're kind of really leaning into your message? And do you feel like it's similar to when you kind of had that big breakout season at Baylor? Yeah, I, I think you can tell when a team is ready to make the turn in their body language, in the way that they walk around the building. It's just confidence. Uh, for young people nowadays, they need there's there's nothing more than confidence. You know, there, there's such a fear of failure uh, because everything's evaluated. And and I think when I walk through our locker rooms and I walk through our weight rooms and I walk out in the field, I see a confident team. I see a team that understands that games are going to come down to the final seconds and. The narrative about close losses, you know, let's, we're going to turn that into close wins. Um, in terms of the teams coming in from from the West Coast, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for them. I do know that I do know that travel and weather are going to be real things in in this new Big Ten. You know, having to play and then travel maybe five or six hours and then play again the next week. Those are all things that the best minds will find the best solutions to. And so we're trying to model everything out as we go. Um, you might play one week and it might be 85 degrees and you might play the next week uh, up in Madison, Wisconsin, and it might be really, really, really cold. And so uh, all of us have our own challenges. I'm kind of focused on ours, but I, I do know this. You know, Deshaun Foster was a player when I was a GA. Lincoln Riley is one of my great friends in coaching. I've coached against him multiple times. Um, I have a lot of respect for the University of, you know, University of Washington. I think Dan Lanning's a great coach, so I think it's only made the conference better. On your right side here, first row. Heather Dinich with ESPN. I hear this confidence from you, but also coming at a time when you do have to go to USC and you're going to play Coach Foster, how do you balance that challenge of being on the brink of something good with the timing of these teams coming into the league and the Big Ten just quite frankly being so much more difficult to win? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. Like I. I laugh with Troy sometimes. Like if 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 Haven Fields, our, our sport administrator, would have said, "Hey, I want to add uh, USC and UCLA to the non-con," and I'd have, I'd have thrown a fit. Like I'm not playing those guys. Well, here they are. So um, I think I think you know when you look at the Big Ten, playing nine conference games. More importantly, playing five road conference games. Not every conference plays five roads. Most of them, some of them, some of the eight, nine team, the eighteen team leagues, they play four road games and sometimes one's like a neutral site so they play three where you have to go into someone else's stadium we have to in the big Ten, we have to go into someone else's stadium in our league five times and duke it out so but i think we'll have a lot of access to the college football playoff and i think i think four teams from this league should get in get in every year because this is the best league this is the nfl of college football in my mind it stretches from coast to coast different time zones different weather that's not to diminish any other league the sec is amazing these other leagues are great but the challenge in the Big Ten is going to be is going to be really difficult. Travel, weather, and great teams. For us, you know, we think every game's a big game because we're playing in it. And uh, we want you, you didn't come to Nebraska because you wanted to play an FCS slate. You came here because you want the challenge of. I mean, we get to go to the Coliseum and and play football. How, how lucky are we? And so that's why you come to Nebraska. That's why in recruiting, like competitiveness is like my number one trait, because I want guys who want to prove it on the field. You know, not not anywhere else. On your left side, Coach. Coach Caleb Adams, Sports Philanthropy Network. Four numbers, 3.241. You were the first coach to come up and talk about the high marks academically of your team. I want to give you a moment to talk about the importance of education, and I want to applaud you for being the first coach to mention that. Well, that's very kind, and I'm, I'm sure all my colleagues are very proud of, um, very proud of all the things that they've done uh, uh, academically as well. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the son of a high school teacher. My dad's a teacher and minister. My mother uh, gave her life to working with women. You know, we lived in New York City, and football has brought me so much. You know, football brought me a, a bachelor's degree. It brought me a master's degree. I was on my way to, to, to my PhD and, and then got lucky enough to get a coaching job, and this is my passion. So uh, we're proud uh, of the players. You know, we have 20 graduates heading into the season. We'll have 10 more in December. 
So when we go to our bowl game, we'll have 30 college graduates on our team. And so um, at the end of the day, you know, we all want to win. But if you don't have a purpose that, that states that we want to raise great men, that we want our players, you know, I want our players someday to look back and say, my life is better because I played at the University of Nebraska and I played for those coaches. And I can think of no better way of doing that than, than education. Uh, followed closely by community service and, and giving back. So we're going to try to win on the football field and off. We've got one final question on the back right. Hi, Coach. Kylan Mills with the Big Ten Network. Great to see you. Uh, something you've said is that it's a priority this season to address the turnover margin. Minus 17 last year, it's been an issue that's plagued this program beyond just that. Just curious as you look ahead to fall camp, how do you try to address that? And where do you start in trying to shift those numbers? Yeah, you know, um, it's it's a it's a blemish. <laughs> you know, it's 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 nothing I've ever done before to be minus seventeen, right? And so, and that's we give the ball away thirty one times. We only took it away fourteen. So, both sides have onus, but to give the ball away thirty one times, and our season would have been different had that not happened. Um, the great news is, is then you, when you look back at a season where you were almost, we were five and seven, and with two games left, that we were still in the math to like to get to Indianapolis. And you have something that outrageous. You understand that, hey, if we just fix one or two things, we can be a really good team. We don't have to do an overhaul. We don't have to fire a bunch of coaches. We don't have to change the offense and defense. We really just have to win the turnover battle. And so um, I think anytime you want to seek change, the first thing you need is buy-in. I think by the end of the year, our players truly understood that, man, we, we, we have to protect the football and we have to take it away. We've practiced it. Uh, the, the thing that I've tried to do is, you know, I, I want to be a lifelong learner. I, I've, I've, I mean, I'm in, I'm in Texas this past week at coaching clinics, and I'm sitting listening to coaches talk, high school coaches, college coaches, about the way they're doing things because we have to find a way to go from minus 17 to plus 7. We have to find a way to get that done. And so we, we, we're going to practice it. We're going to coach it. We're going to, you know, allocate playing time based upon who protects the ball but also who takes it away. And uh, But I think the buy-in came from our players early on. They recognized we need to do this because we have a really good football team. And um, you know what? If you turn the ball over three times, you're probably going to have a close loss. The close losses at Nebraska are not an affliction. It's, you know, we don't need to get out of voodoo doll. We need to hold the ball properly and knock it out, make one more catch, have a little bit more confidence, and go make one more play and win a couple games, and all of a sudden we'll be talking in a different tone. Coach Rule, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Go Big Red. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. <clears throat> I want to thank the, the commissioner and congratulate the commissioner. I think he's done a phenomenal job of positioning our conference and a position of strength in a very, very challenging time in, in college athletics history. So many changes and has done a really good job and done a great job of communicating uh, with the head coaches, with the ADs, and, and with the presidents. I want to welcome the four new teams to our conference. Uh, what an exciting time in college football. What an exciting time for the Big Ten. Uh, going to create some really, really exciting matchups that I think our fans are going to enjoy, uh, but also obviously going to create some challenges as well. Uh, some of those challenges are magnified uh, for a Penn State being one of the most Northeast schools. Uh, without an international airport for the media that's been to, to Happy Valley. You know some of the travel challenges that exist there. Uh, so we spent a ton of time uh, talking to NFL organizations as well as college programs that have, have done East Coast to West Coast travel during a season and what are the best practices for that. So, um, you know, put a lot of time into that. And we're excited about those opportunities. You talk about the season, I think one of the big storylines for us, obviously, is, is three new coordinators, uh, which is unusual. Uh, Andy Kotelnicki, who we hired as our offensive coordinator from uh, the University of Kansas, uh, has, been, has been great. Um, I got a ton of respect for what they were able to do at Buffalo as well as what they were able to do at Kansas. I got a ton of respect for his former head coach and Lance. Uh, and, and have followed those guys closely for a long time. I think the big thing was, was this going to make sense for him and us? We're not starting from scratch. Uh, so are you able to come in, study what we do, uh, what can stay the same, and, and what needs to change? I think the big thing, obviously, did a ton of good things on offense last year, but we were not explosive enough. 
and uh, Coach Kodal, Nicky, and what they were able to do at Kansas the last two years, extremely explosive. Uh, and just did a really good job as a relational leader coming in and building those relationships with our staff and players. Uh, on the defensive side of the ball, a name that you guys are all familiar with, and Tom Allen was a head coach in this conference for a long time, so got great perspective there. Uh, and Tom was in a position where he did not really need to take a job, so spent a ton of time making sure that Penn State was the right fit for him. And, uh, and he was the right fit for us. Had about a two-week interview process with us, uh, actually in Happy Valley uh, during bowl prep, and that went really well. Tom's done a great job, obviously. A little bit different situation depending on what, what metric you look at. We had arguably the number one, two, or three defense in college football last year, so uh, Tom is stepping into that position and has done a – done a really, really good job, excited about how he has joined our staff and impacted our players. And then Justin Lustig, our special teams coordinator, Justin has done a great job. He's from Pennsylvania, is widely regarded as one of the better special teams coordinators in the country. So uh, really impressed with those, what those guys have done, as well as our team. We've had a great spring. We had a great summer. And obviously, we got an important time ahead of us with camp starting here very, very soon. So appreciate the opportunity to be with you guys in year 11. Uh, and also, I want to take a moment and, uh, and thank and show respect uh, for Coach Ferentz and what he's been able to do at Iowa. It's unbelievable. In some ways, it's sad that 11 years has become the exception in college football, what, but what he's been able to do at the University of Iowa is super impressive, and I wanted to congratulate him and all his success. So open up the questions. We got first row on your uh, right side. Kenneth Barry, Touchdowns and Tangents. Hey, Kenneth. How's it going? Good morning. Uh, Coach, in – all your years, you look back at, you know, the Vanderbilt year where you guys had a record-breaking season. You look at the year you made it to the Rose Bowl, you know, with Saquon and everything. How close do you feel like this team is, and how much do you feel like they mirror the character and the identity of those teams? And this being your 11th year in the conference, how good does it feel seeing the influx of African-American head coaches not only just getting jobs across the landscape, but the Big Ten pretty much leading all of the conferences with the number of African-American head coaches that are currently uh, present. Yeah, I'll answer the second part first. You know, I, I love the fact that Big Ten, the Big Ten is one of the leaders in this space. Um, I think that sends a very, very clear and loud message that people are going to be judged by their work uh, and their production. Um, and... I think the Big Ten is a, a great example of that. Obviously, something that myself and Mike Loxley and a lot of the guys take a, take a ton of pride in and have ton of, done a ton of work on as well. Uh, and hopefully that becomes more of the trend across college football as well as the NFL. I uh, just spent some time the other day with Raheem Morris, who's one of my best friends. He was the defensive coordinator at Kansas State when I was the offensive coordinator and is now the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons, getting a second chance, which is also not common. Uh, so I think that's, that's powerful. And then, you know, about our team and maybe some of the similarities to some of the teams that we had at Vanderbilt and over our, our time at Penn State as well. Uh, I think it starts with the three gentlemen that we brought with us, um, you know, to, to, to this event. Uh, guys that are experienced guys, guys that have had a ton of success on the football field. They've handled themselves the right way academically on and off the field uh, and have won a ton of games. You know, they're guys that embrace that we're at a place like Penn State where we've been able to consistently, for the most part, win 10 or 11 games, um, but that's not the expectation at Penn State. They chose Penn State just like I chose Penn State to compete for championships, uh, and we embrace that. Um, but we are one of the few programs in the country you can win 10 or 11 games and, and people are unhappy. So we embrace that. We're excited about those opportunities, and it starts for us at West Virginia in Morgantown, which is going to be a challenging opening game. First row here. Good morning, Coach. Uh, Nick Hamilton, Nightcast Media. Hey, Nick. 
How you doing? Good. Uh, once I ask you about Abdul Carter, uh, him changing positions from linebacker to defensive end, how much do you feel like that will strengthen your defense uh, this season? And also, how does that uh, play, Kate, as far as throughout the locker room, as far as taking that type of role, being a leader uh, in the locker room? Yeah, so I, I think first thing is he'll play both. Uh, we have the flexibility to play him at both positions. He's one of the unique athletes you know, that was playing linebacker at 250 pounds. Um, and you never know how that transition is going to go, playing in space at the linebacker position compared to moving up uh, you know, to the line of scrimmage and having to go against offensive tackles. He made the adjustment you know, pretty quickly. And uh, at the end of the day, you're talking about one of the more explosive physical athletes in all of college football. So we think he's got a chance to make a significant impact week to week. We'll decide where he's going to have the most impact for us, uh, whether it's on the line of scrimmage at defensive end or in the linebacker uh, position this, this spring. Uh, he stayed mainly at defensive end to get comfortable with that. And then after that, we had a really good conversation. He's open to, to doing both. That'll also put us in a position where people can't game plan and know exactly where he's going to be on the defense. So we're excited about that. But he's just, he's really grown up. Uh, I'm proud of him and his development uh, academically as a, as a student athlete. Uh, as well as a football player, and we need him and expect for him to have a huge year for us. Um, got a very, very close relationship with him and his father, uh, and I'm proud of him and excited about what he's going to do this year. On your left side. James, Bill Rabinowitz from the Columbus Dispatch. Hey, Bill. You got Julian Fleming as a transfer from Ohio State. How excited are you to have him? What kind of impact do you expect him to have for a receiver's unit of it? It wasn't all that explosive last year. Yeah, he's a, a veteran guy uh, that's played in this conference. He knows what it's all about. Obviously, you know we got a ton of history with him and his family. Um, recruited him very heavily out of high school, uh, but he's thriving. You know, he's he's very comfortable. He's very confident. He really came, uh, got on campus like most guys should do, kept his mouth shut, worked, earned everybody's respect through that first, and now is really developing into a leader for us. Uh, his improvement from the end of spring to now, uh, he is healthy and, and lean and explosive and fast right now, and just from the feedback from the players over the summer, uh, has really done a nice job. Looking at all, all the metrics and the numbers from our strength staff is, is in a really good position. I think he's got a huge chip on his shoulder and excited about the opportunity at Penn State and has, has really turned into one of the leaders in that wide receiver room. Uh, so we're happy to have him and expect for him to do some big things for us this year, and I appreciate the question. Last row on your right side. Coach Franklin, Kyle Golick, uh, Mike Farrell Sports. Hey, Kyle. Hey, how are you? Good. Hey, Tell Mike I said hi. Will do. Hey, you mentioned earlier about Southern Cal, Oregon, UCLA, Washington uh, joining the league. After the 2018 Ohio State game, you had your what I refer to as the epic good to great to elite rant. So with these teams coming in, where do you feel Penn State stands in the pecking order? And a follow-up, if you don't feel uh, Penn State's quite at elite, where do you what do you think the Nittany Lions have to do to achieve the elite status? Yeah, I would describe it as a speech, not a rant, first of all. Um, but no, I think, you know, again, back to the comment earlier, you're talking about a program that you can win 10 or 11 games and, and, and people are not happy or satisfied. And that's inside the Lash building and that's outside the Lash building. We totally get that and, and um, embrace that. I think our players understand that when we recruit them. Our staff understands that when we hire them. Uh, and as the head coach, I embrace all those things as well. Um, I think week in and week out, the Big Ten is arguably the best conference in all of college football. I've been fortunate to be a head coach in the SEC as well as the Big Ten, so I think I got good, I got good perspective on that. 
And then, like you mentioned, adding the four new schools uh, makes it even more challenging. So we'll have an opportunity to figure that out and figure that out real quick, starting at West Virginia. Uh, we're fortunate to play most of those teams that we discussed. We want to play those teams uh, that you discussed, both that have been in the conference historically as well as that have been added. Um, for us, we got to play our best when our best is needed most in the biggest games, uh, at the biggest moments. And I think if you look at us, specifically last year, did some phenomenal things. That's the step that we need to take. And having a returning starting quarterback obviously helps with that. Uh, we're a quarterback-driven game, whether it's in the NFL, college, or high school. And having a returning quarterback at that position that did some phenomenal things. I think he was second in touchdown to interception ratio. I think he broke the national record in, in completions without an interception. Uh, so did, did some phenomenal things, and we got to build on that. And then I think the pieces of the puzzle around him, tight end, running back, and then receiver's been – the big question mark really since last year. We got a ton of confidence in that room. Those guys got a huge chip on their shoulder. Back to the question earlier about the addition of Julian Fleming as well as the guys in that room. Uh, they've had a great summer and we got a ton of confidence of what they're going to do this year. We're going to have to play well early on, build confidence and carry that confidence throughout the season. Coach Franklin, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, sir.